Hello, and welcome to today's Environment and Energy Leader webinar titled Technology, a path to reliable field data with quality assurance, accuracy, and validation, sponsored by Montrose Environmental Group. My name is Jessica Hunt, and I'm the Director of Live Events for e and &E Leader. Before I hand the presentation over to today's speaker, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items with attendees. And I am going to apologize in advance if you hear either of my dogs barking during today's event. As always, this webinar will be available on demand within three to four hours of the live event ending. If you are having any technical issues at the start of the webinar or at any point during it, please utilize the help widget at the bottom of your console. If you are still having issues after performing the steps listed, please send a message to me using the Q&A chat widget that is open on your screen. Please submit questions for today's speaker using this widget as well. We have set aside some time at the end of today's event to answer audience questions. And I know I'm very much looking forward to hearing from today's speaker who is on screen with me right now. Joining us today is Blake Erickson, Business Development at Montrose. And at this point, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to him and rejoin everybody for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Jessica, for the nice intro. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for having me. And I want to thank uh, Energy and Environment Leader for having Montrose do this little presentation today, specifically on the FTIR. And look forward to getting in, into it today and answering any questions that you may have. So getting into it. You know, what we're going to do today, we want to talk a little bit about what is the FTIR and how can it help you with your processes. You know, a lot of what we're going to be talking today is going to be revolving around stack testing, performance testing. Um, but I do want to re reiterate the fact that the FTIR is a multi-purpose tool and it can be used for a lot of things, including process gas, optimization and a whole slew of things. We'll get into that more. So it's not just a stack testing instrument can be used in a lot of applications and furthermore we'll go into sort of the reality of traditional testing uh, what stack testing is what do we need to do to get good data uh, the capabilities of instruments and then some of the advanced instrumentation that is out right now um, what's currently being developed and then finally we're just going to wrap it up with a bunch of data overview and some summary and questions So what is the FTIR? Well, FTIR is a, a fancy instrument and it's got a long name, but it's just Fourier Transform Infrared. Um, it has a ton of applications and it's used in a whole wide range of settings. Uh, you'll find FTIRs everywhere from semiconductors to you know cement plants. And they're really, they're really sweet instruments because they are collecting data in real time. It is very precise and very accurate. But I must reiterate, it is precise and accurate when it is used by the right trained person. Uh, it's a good tool for compliance and engineering. So we use this in source testing for a whole slew of purposes. But one of the main ones is in performance stack testing uh, for achieving compliance. Uh, and these can be used for everything from RADAs to CPTs on cement kilns to, you know, you just you name it, destruction efficiencies on RTOs. There's a whole wide array of things that the FTIR can do. Um, and it's also a really, really good tool for engineering. And when I say engineering, you know, we can take these things on site. We can look through process optimization or what's in your gas matrix um, to determine, you know, what's going on with your system. And from the stack side, you know, stack testing is one of the furthest things downstream with what you need to do on the environmental side of things. But the more you understand your stack and your emissions data, the more you'll actually understand your whole unit. Um, and there's really skilled eh &S and stack testing folks out there that can see just a little bit of variation and some you know, data that they're used to seeing on a source. And they can be like, hey, you know, the O2 is doing this, you might wanna check out this or you name it. So uh, the sharper you get on the emission side, you really will know your whole process from start to finish. So it's a really, really powerful tool. Uh, and like I said, these things are typically installed in 
you know, SEMS, you'll see them in cement plants all over the place and on dynos within auto manufacturing facilities. Uh, really, the list of places where these things are is relatively endless. Uh, and like I said, found in many fields of study, and the beauty of the FTIR is that it can quite literally see hundreds of compounds, and that's not an exaggeration by any stretch of the imagination. It is a very versatile tool. It's really good for a lot of things, um, but it shouldn't, or it should be noted that it's not perfect. So there are certain things we can't see, uh, which are like homonuclear diatomics, that's your O2, your chlorines, things along those lines. If you remember your chemistry course, uh, we can see things that have a dipole moment. Um, and we're looking at, you know, compounds that have bond rotation and movement. And if there's a lot of stability there, we can't see it. And, and then, of course, we can't see like particulate or solids, metals, things along those lines. Um, so the FTIR is really a gaseous phase, at least with the ones we're talking about today. It's a gaseous phase instrument, but it is very versatile and it is widely used in a lot of industries. So the reality of emissions testing, um, I always, I, I, if you've ever listened, uh, you know, been tortured of listening through one of these presentations that I give on source testing, I, I use this image on the right all the time. And it's always kind of a fun story for me because, uh, you know, most of us the past couple of years, we've been sitting in these virtual conferences. Uh, we've been dying to get back out there in person. And I, for one, look forward to doing these in person as much as I can. So trying to bring a little bit of storytelling into it so it's not completely bland because the FTIR, you know, if we go into the technical details, it can get a little dry. Um, so it, you see the gentleman there and he's hauling up that Home Depot bucket. And this image is taken from relatively far away. You know, you zoom in, um, but he's up there. And he's about 150 or so feet up in the air. He's up on a natural gas turbine. Uh, and this industry always amazes me. So this is more or less of a, a thank you if you are involved with this industry. If you have anything to do with stack testing, it is a very tough job. You know, you you got guys out there or girls, all weather, all season. Doesn't matter if it's rain, snow, you know, shine, sleet. Doesn't matter. You got to get your stack testing done. And our teams go out there at all periods of the year. They work holidays, weekends. It's a tough gig. So he's pulling that bucket up there, um, you know, and he's getting all this equipment going, you know, all the monorails, the pumps, everything weighs a bunch in, in order to get really low data and not low data, but low numbers, low concentration numbers, it takes a lot of equipment. So that bucket and that rope's going to be pulled up dozens of times. And I've been told by some fellow colleagues that, Stack testing is the only industry that we know of where you actually start at the top and you work your way down. And I, I say that because it's it's interesting. That's the, the corporate ladder of stack is you're starting at the top and working your way down. But a little bit of a, a nuance with it is once you get to the ground, you're then running a trailer. And uh, that's pretty stressful, too. So it's not a complete cakewalk to get off the stack. And uh, that's the running joke as well, is that sometimes being up at the top isn't so bad because even though it's a lot of you know physical work and you're working in all these elements, um, you know once you're set up and testing, it's kind of smooth sailing and things are good. So you can enjoy the view while you're up there. So like I said, not to be cheesy, I just, I like to give a formal thank you for those who are involved, no matter what, if you're on the EHS side, if you're a plant owner or operator, um, just know that, you know, we thank you for doing this because this is a tough industry to be in. So real brief, we're not going to hit this too hard, but uh, stack testing is essentially, you know, required by regulations. And that's how we, you know, we stay in business is based off of what is out there from a regulata regulatory standpoint. Um, the beauty of stack testing, and this kind of ties in with the FTIR a little bit, is because there's a wide range of applicability. Uh, you know, don't just check that compliance box. Understand that if you're doing stack testing, you can do it for engineering purposes. You can optimize your unit, then you can tune, um, which in the whole grand scheme of things saves you a ton of money downstream. Uh, stack testing is has been around for a decent amount of time now. We currently have 134 
Uh, that's probably a little bit more right now, 134 plus methods that we use. And we can really see just about anything that you need to see in the air. Uh, it's very important. It's critical. You know, Montrose, our, our company and our corporate mission is to protect the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the soil that feeds us. And we believe that, you know, on my side of the business within the air, air impacts everything, right? So if you have a source and it, that's carrying things downwind, it's going to pollute the waterways, groundwater, soil. Um, so really the stack testing is so important because we are literally helping protect the air that we breathe for everybody throughout the world. Um, and this is applicable through many source categories. So whether it's an RTO, a cement kiln, doesn't really matter if it emits into the air, we can do it and we can do car exhaust, uh, you name it. We're always game for a challenge. We are scientists first and foremost as well. Um, so this is a, a challenge and a joy for us to do. And like I said, not to hit this one too hard, but disadvantages, uh, if you are a member of the field, uh, very labor intensive, it is very specialized. So we expect a lot out of our, our test teams and project managers. You, know, you have to be very well versed in the methods. The methods are very dry, tough to read sometimes. You're working at all times of the year. Uh, and with some of the, the methods that we have, like metals, particulate matter, um, they're not always available on site. And that's what we'll get to in a little bit. But the beauty of some of the newer technology is we can get that real time on site data right then and there. Um, some of these other methods, they got to be shipped off to an, a, lab, a lab, a accredited laboratory. And then it takes a couple of weeks sometimes for those results to get turned around. So speaking of the wet chemistry methods, uh, these are just a couple of examples. And like I said, we're not gonna beat this one too much up today. Um, many of you probably know quite a few of these, but just as an example, there's a lot of equipment with this stuff. Uh, you can see the probe, the meter box pump, you name it. And these are those things that gotta get carried up. And once again, uh, the guy or gal who's pulling this stuff up 20 pound pump doesn't seem so bad on the ground, but you add that wind resistance and a, a really long rope, uh, man, you are, you're sore by the end of the day and you got to climb up to the top to get there. So very physical. Um, this is very technique driven. So some of the best part or project managers out there in the stack testing world, you know, a lot of firms have really good project managers. There are guys that have done this for 20 plus years. It takes a really, really long time, very technique driven. Uh, they're very analyte specific. So if you're testing for, you know, carb 430, we're testing for formaldehyde via wet chemistry method, 26A, HCL, uh, and you name it. So you got to really know your methods. You got to really know what you're looking for. But at the end of the day, uh, a lot of equipment and test runs, you know, tend to be pretty long. If you're looking on a turbine, and you need really, really low particulate, uh, your test runs can be upwards of four plus hours in order for you to get to that, you know, that below detection limit to your emission limit. Um, so there takes a lot of time. So the one thing I want to reiterate with Stack is that as much as we would love it to be an on the shelf item, ready to go and deliver it to you next day, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces to get this stuff done and done well. Um, so generally, uh, we want to get a test scheduled for you well in advance and well prepared. And that's how we're going to have a really successful program. So what it really all boils down to is that field testing is tough. And, and a lot of us with what we do in the environmental sector, we all, we all know that this is a tough field. And I'm not going to beat this one up too much, but just kind of some general discretion before getting into the nitty gritty of the FTIRs, we kind of want a background of how we get really good data. Um, and it should be noted, especially with the FTIRs, is that a lot of these studies are done on a bench top. And, you know, they're done in a laboratory, they use some sort of artificial stack gas, uh, they're making some blends, and they're making bold claims. So no matter what, a manufacturer will sell you the moon, uh, what we take a lot of pride in doing is we will take these instruments and we really put them to the test out in the field. Um, and, you know, we, we do lots of benchtop testing as well, but the only true way to know that these instruments work and that they work well is by getting them out in the field and actually sampling real stack gas from real sources. 
you're only as good as your equipment. I'll say this a uh, hundred times over. Um, you could be the best spectroscopist, chemist, physicist, whatever you want to be. Um, and you can run an FTIR, but at the end of the day, you're only as good as your equipment. So no matter how sharp you are, if you have poor sampling lines, poor sampling conditions, poor gases, regulators, you name it, the list goes on and on. You're just not going to get good data. All of these things compound, you know, one thing after another. We joke within stack testing, uh, if it can happen, it will. Um, they just create a severe impact to your overall data analysis and data quality objective. So it's going to make your QAQC, which is quality assurance, quality control, which is done on site difficult. It makes your validation difficult. It's just a headache that can be easily avoided. So please, if you are in the stack testing space, you got to use good equipment. You got to take good care of your equipment. Um, don't bring the ragtag heated sample lines and trailer to site. Get that stuff patched up and ready to go. Uh, and then if you're a customer or regulatory agent listening into this one, but don't be afraid of the FTIR. It's, uh, you know, it's not the black box, the voodoo box. I'm sure I'll say this again. Um, it is a, a very powerful instrument when it's used in the right pair of hands. And I know the FTIR doesn't have a great reputation in all corners of the country and even internationally. Um, but I can say there are good firms out there. They exist. And there are people that are purely dedicated to this technology and firmly believe in it. And I have seen firsthand when this is done the right way, it gives you really, really great results in real time, right on site. So as a customer, um, don't be afraid to ask the technical questions. Know a little bit about Method 320 or at least just the general overview of what you should be asking. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. And what I want you to do is expect a very well-trained operator. Uh, anytime you hear someone say, yeah, I'm dangerous with an FTIR, uh, kind of wave that red flag and be like, oh, are you are you dangerous to yourself or are you you know dangerous as a whole? Because uh, we're not looking for dangerous. We're looking for very well-trained seasoned operators that run this thing and are very confident with what they're doing. So furthermore. It's as simple as the title goes on this slide. Uh, you know, a healthy instrument goes a long way. And we're not going to go too deep into the details today. And we're not going to bore you with the Fourier transform math, the calculus, anything like that. Uh, but basically, in the most simplest way that an FTIR works is we are essentially taking pictures of spectra during, you know, a given data interval period. And we have the ability to go back and look at that data to validate and make sure that it is done correctly. Now, this might sound scary, but to me, it's really impactful because a lot of stack testing methods that exist out there, you're quite literally just using calibration gas on site. You're calibrating the instrument, you're telling it what it needs to see, and then you go on to the next one. Now, that, that's fine and dandy because most of these firms are doing this the right way. But who's to say that, you know, an Excel sheet can't be changed a little bit or things can't be re-looked at? I mean, we all know that that's a possibility, right? So the beauty of the FTIR to me is that regardless of how the data was collected, as long as it was collected in a proper way, we can go back and verify those numbers and, and validate to see that, hey, that number is real. And that one's not so real, but we can add or subtract compounds and clean up the analysis a little bit. So a very well-trained person, a well-trained eye will be able to tell if some things are going wrong with the recipe and sampling development. Um, but just know that's my thought with the FTIR. I think that's why it's so powerful. And that's why I'm going to really press the issue of data validation today. If your firm does not validate their data, you need to start doing it today. Uh, and I'm sure I'm going to say that five to 10 more times as we go, because I think it's something that really needs to be to be pushed with this technology. So that's it. It generally takes a picture. We can see hundreds of things through, you know, a broad range of compounds from, you know, on this example, from allied methane, ethylene, you name it. Uh, the list is quite extensive for our recipe list. And we have hundreds of these things that we can see. Uh, the tricky part is doing the picket fencing and all the, the chemistry to make sure that the recipe 
the analysis is accurate. And that's where validation is so important. But we can't get to that point without a healthy instrument. So make sure your, your instrument is healthy. If you're using an MKS 2030 uh, or a max IR or anything, make sure that that single beam is nice and strong because the higher your single beam, the more your signal strength, the better your resolution and the better your detection limits. So if you're running an instrument with poor signal strength, you're not gonna be able to promise really low detection limits because a trained eye can see and say, hey, there's way too much variability in the zero data. Um, your detection limits just aren't real. So expect uh, out of the box in the standard FTIR detection limits can't really get much lower than a couple hundred PPV um, without some modifications. So typical field mistakes. Uh, there's a whole slew of these, but for the case of today, uh, we just want to reiterate, you know, we can treat the FTIR like other analyzers. And we know a lot of stack testing firms, you know, throw these instruments in a, a rack in a trailer and they bounce down the road. Um, I highly recommend that we don't do that with an FTIR. Get it its own nice little Pelican case. Make sure it's, you know, well insulated and there's some suspension there. There are some internal suspension pieces that help these things, you know, stick together. But with the amount of travel that we do in our field, uh, mistakes do happen. Uh, improper use of span factors. So a span factor more or less is just the multiplier. And you'll see these things on a lot of instruments, including CO analyzers, NOx analyzers, you name it. And it quite literally in the FTR world is, like I said, just a multiplier. So what that means is you can have a gas a cow gas and say it's not coming in exactly where you need it to be, well, you can apply a span and you can tell the FTIR, hey, it should be reading this number. But um, as what I was taught, you know, we don't want to go anything over plus or minus 5% with most of the QAQC criteria that we're looking at in the FTIR world. So please, if you are using these things on the field, check your span factors. If you have anything over 5%, it's very likely that there's some deeper issues going on. It could be an analysis issue. It could be an instrument issue. There's a whole slew of things, um, but your span factor should be left at a solid 1.0. I'm not purging. When you're done with the job, make sure you get these FTIRs on purge. They're expensive pieces of instrumentation. Uh, they deserve to be treated as a laboratory grade instrument. They are. They've just been retrofitted for testing. Um, so ultra high purity nitrogen needs to be going to the interferometer to the optics you know to keep that thing purging keep it dry uh, keep it on even and it keeps these things happy rushing rushing is a, a huge thing in our field uh you know in my I don't want to call it a previous life but in my previous role as a, a project manager with ftirs I uh, was always looking forward to getting home on the weekend or in time. And sometimes that does not happen with what we do. You got to stick it out uh, and, and get the work done for the customer. But, um, you know, rushing to get home, not doing proper checks, not monitoring that equipment, that's going to burn you. Um, so take a deep breath, know your methods, know what you're doing, and know kind of the, the bigger picture here is that you're going to be helping a customer out with this sort of stuff. So take your time. If you're not monitoring your equipment, you know, if you have any sort of temperature loss, that's going to really impact your data. And we'll talk about it a little bit more, but especially on the FTIR, if you're losing temperature on your lines, you're going to have really poor data analysis, especially with sticky gases. A lack of training, we see this all the time. And once again, it not to, it's not a brag or anything, it's not a shot. I've had the luxury of being subcontracted by a lot of the major source testing firms and a lot of smaller firms. And we get a lot of, hey, can we just watch over your shoulder and, and figure out what to do from there? And you know, for as long as I've been doing this, which isn't too long, but it's going on about eight years, I'm still learning every single day on how to do this even better than I was yesterday. Um, so the, the one, the two day training programs quite frankly, just don't work. You know, they're a good start, but it takes consistency and sharpening that saw every single day. That's what we want to see. So the hand-me-down training programs, it's kind of like that game of telephone, right? Where you tell somebody something, they leave, you pass it on to somebody else, they leave. And before you know it, 
you just have a crummy training program, but you're doing things the way you were taught. So you don't think you're doing them the wrong way. Uh, and that's ultimately scary for both sides because you're doing what you think is right. But sometimes it's just not the right way. So it kind of goes into that last point there at the bottom. Ask for help. There's firms out there that are more than happy to help. Uh, and we take a lot of pride in what we do. So on the right side of the screen, filtration. You got to filter with the FTIR. I don't care if it's a turbine, anything along those lines. It is a must. There's some debate and argument as to where you should be filtering, whether it's at the probe tip or down at the ground. My recommendation, do it up at the probe tip. It makes a lot more sense. Scientifically, it makes sense. Um, you're not contaminating your heated sample line. You're doing things the right way. Your sample temps should match your calibrations. This one's huge. I see this all the time where you have a firm that's running some ragtag and heated sample line at like 240, 250 Fahrenheit. Um, you need to be buying those lines that can get up there to that 375 range. You want your sampling temps to match your calibrations. Once again, it's just to go overall a better way to do the testing. Uh, and that's the way it should be done. And there's some applications where that can be changed and you need to for certain things. That's understood. But nine times out of 10, they should match your calibration data. And of course, just weather challenges. We've kind of talked about that already. Believe it or not, ambient temperature will actually impact the, uh, the single beam from time to time. If it's really hot in a trailer or really cold, you might get some signal loss or gain, believe it or not. I've seen instruments that love the cold and then some that hate the cold uh, and vice versa with heat. So uh, we joke that the instruments have personalities and that's very true with temperature. So uh, and last but not least in proper use of data or the proper data storage, I should say, make sure you're backing this data up, get them onto a server. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've had firms be like, hey, we lost the data. It's just inexcusable at this point in time. You know, you can upload it to the cloud, whatever you need to do. Um, just make sure you're doing that. So taking all these points into account, you know, the mistakes really impact your data quality. And uh, it's pretty well known that some gases aren't going to be impacted as bad, you know, such as your NOx, your CO, you name it. Um, but your sticky gases like your, you know, HCl, ammonia, uh, and there's a whole slew of others, those are going to be greatly impacted. Um, so we know that you can run a, a heated sample line at, you know, in the high 200s to get basic combustion data. But if you're looking for the, the important, and I shouldn't say important, but the, the tougher gases to see, uh, you got to be running at the appropriate temperatures. Make sure you're monitoring your temperatures. Um, this is so important, especially with the push for the advanced instrumentation that we're seeing. And we'll talk about the actual advanced instrumentation later. Um, these data, it compounds greatly because we are claiming that you can see PPB level detection, but if you have any of these errors compounding, that's just not a real number. You're just more or less throwing an arbitrary detection limit out there. Um, so it's absolutely important that you have a qualified person, a well-trained person out there doing this sort of testing. Uh, it's going to lead to biased numbers, like I said, and, you know, the worst case scenario, you know, we get a lot of validation work where other firms will send us their data and sometimes they'll be like, hey, is there anything you can do with this or can you help us out? Uh, and if it's collected the right way with the proper QAQC, 100%, we can validate, we can make sure the data makes sense, and then we can get it on its way and you can submit it to the customer. Uh, but I will forewarn you that if it is collected poorly, and usually we can tell based off the data, um, reprocessing, no matter who does it, it, it can't fix it. Um, and that's just something we don't do. We don't, we will never step over that line where it's like, if it was collected poorly, we're never going to make the data work for you. Um, but we will absolutely help you out if it's collected the right way. So I can't stress this point enough. Just use really good equipment, have a good training program. And everything is going to be just fine. This is a really nice case of like a cold spot and how certain gases are impacted uh, more so than others. Um, if you look here, let me see. There we go. So if you look at your CO and your NO here, you see these like kind of nice 
peaks and then they drop straight down pretty flat uh, back down to zero right away. Um, you know, you would look at this if you were just looking at NOSEO, be like, yeah, we're collecting good data, right? Like all is good. Um, but if you look at what I constitute as a sticky gas, ammonia, NH3, and the water, you can tell just by looking at the data how nasty a cold spot will be. Now, believe it or not, the heated sample line that this team was using was actually reading somewhere around 360, 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so from that perspective, you think things are all good and dandy. But what we have found is that a lot of sampling lines, especially if they're a little older, they burn out in spots. Um, and that temperature control is, you know, that TC is being fed a couple of feet away from the controller, usually on the ground or near the controller. Um, so it's only reading that point. So even though it's hot there, it might be completely dead on the other half of the line. So this is going to severely impact your data. And you're going to see things like this where you're sampling, ammonia comes up, and boom, comes down where it should be zero, but then it kind of keeps popping up and down. And you see this, it matches the water almost perfectly. Um, and that's just because ammonia is water soluble. Um, and when it's at a certain temperature in the heated sample lines, you're going to get this sort of action. So this was a huge indication that there was a cold spot that heated line needed to be fixed. But it's a really nice representation that some gases behave a lot differently than others and why it's so important to make sure you're running hot and fast through your FTIR sampling system. So the must-haves of QAQC, you know, we're not going to go through these in tremendous detail, but for today's purposes, keeping it short and sweet, uh, you, at a minimum, you want three gases, which are nitrogen, a CTS, which is a calibration transfer standard, and then a spiking analyte. So all I'll say to that is know your method, run your direct calibrations. You want to run a zero. You want to run a background. You want to make sure you're starting off strong every single day. That background is so critical to your data collection. Uh, there's a couple pieces of critical. Well, most QAQC is critical to the FTIR to make sure that it's doing the right thing. That's the reason that they exist. It's the reason that they're in the methods. So run your directs, understand your method, ASTM 6348, Method 320, method 321, 318, whatever you're using, depends on the site. 318 is for like fiberglass, 320 is pretty versatile for a lot of sources, 321 is for cement. Once you run your directs, run your system checks, you absolutely need to have response times. And all response time is, is you're starting a calibration gas at zero, you're sending it up there and you're waiting to get it back down. On a 100 foot sampling system, your response time should be relatively quick, about 15 to 30 seconds, believe it or not. Uh, if they take several minutes, you either have flow issues or a whole slew of other problems going on. Uh, and one of the most critical pieces of QAQC in the FTI world is spiking. Uh, and like I said, we won't get into the details of exactly what to do, um, but what we see a lot in the field is what we constitute as goosing. And quite frankly, it's completely wrong way to do this. Uh, and a lot of regulators are getting sharper with this and seeing this. So what they do is they send their sticky calibration gas. And let's just pretend it's HCL or ammonia or something like that. They send it at full blast through the system and they essentially cut it to where they need on their dilution factor. And then they let that thing fall. And then what they do is they grab a little chunk of data that they, it looks good, but then it keeps falling but they're not gonna record that data. So it's all good, right? Well, like I said, states are starting to ask to see the entire spike process um, because they've heard, they're starting to get burned by this where it's like, okay, uh, the HCL concentration is zero and it's just because you're condensing. And believe it or not, a, about a half inch of exposed stainless steel on an HCL sampling system is going to impact your data analysis. I and mean, that's how volatile this stuff is. So understand how to spike, do it the right way, and just know that states are getting a little sharper with us, have the proper cylinders, and make sure your delivery to your instrument is clean and timely. And that's how you're gonna get good data. So checks and balances, you know, how do we know that we did a great job? Um, you know, wanna know that your data is accurate. 
and you're going to get the data and you're like, eh, I, I don't really know if that's it. How, how do I know that it's accurate? How do I know that it's precise? Well, validation, once again, validate, validate, validate your data it needs to happen. Uh, it's a way to tell that if you're unsure about the data or if you think the concentration is just quite frankly wrong, you need to look at it and validate it and you can make sure that, hey, our data is right. And then if it's impacting your data analysis and you have some large interference, you have large negatives in your data set, uh, you might need to add or subtract something to your recipe in order to make it right. So what is it? You know, we're not going into all this in complete detail, but you basically have three verticals here, right, of data validation. And they basically check the FTIR diagnostics, the data analysis, and the QAQC that is done on site. So each one of these is super imperative and super important to understand that we're collecting good data um, when it's done the right way. And you're taking your screenshots and you're doing these sort of things the right way. It's a really good way to make sure at the state level or EPA or as a customer to know that the firm that is doing your testing is doing it the right way. So they need to have this stuff on hand because we are seeing that it is being asked for more and more often. So why is it important? Well, we already been through that. This is just sort of a nice example of why validation is so critical to what we do. So long story short of this, had we originally reported what the FTIR was saying without validating, we would have vastly misrepresented methanol in this sample. Um, and you'll see there's a big interference here. And what we were originally gonna tell the customer is that they were out of compliance based off this concentration. But after doing validation and adding and reprocessing, it turns out that their concentration was far lower because of this large interference. So if we scroll through here, you know, when we're validating, we're largely taking out the major interferences like water, ammonia, CO2. You know, we'll kind of go through these one by one. And you'll see this big old amine that was in the way of where, right where our methanol is located. Um, so when we take that out and we add it to the recipe, it helps the FTIR do the analysis a little better. And what we found is that the concentration was more along the lines of 2.8 ppm. Uh, and we would have originally reported this completely, you know, way higher than, you know, 2.8 ppm. Um, and quite frankly, we would have been given the data or the, the customer really poor data. So thanks to validation, it sort of saved us, but it also helped the customer out because, uh, this was actually what was coming out of their stack. So these three slides is basically what this, these are all saying. These are actually from the methodology, whether it's method 320 or ASTM 6348, what these all are saying, um, going back just so you can kind of glance over for them. It basically says that validation is a must. You know, there's no way around it. It's in the methodology. For some reason, I think it's kind of gone to the wayside for some, you know, firms for some reason, um, but it's literally there. And so for all the state folks and, you know, EPA folks that, you know, oversee this testing, make sure you're asking for validated data because it is such an important piece of our puzzle. Uh, it's a, a way that we know that we're collecting data the right way. So once again, it's in the methods, has to happen. Um, and just goes into, you know, why do we need to improve the reliability of the test results? And it's just because traditionally there's a lot of variability. Uh, you know, we want to be like that trend line, right? And keep progressing, keep pushing the arrow higher. Uh, what we're seeing in the past and what happens is that the actual results might not properly represent the true emissions. And what we say by that is like, um, you know, if you get a detection limit, how, what is it below a detection limit? How, how do we know that number is real? So um, on the flip side, if those results are above the limit, you get your NOVs, you get your fines, you have extra run times, more testing, retest, you name it. Uh, quite frankly, it just sucks for you as the customer. So we want to know that we're getting accurate and precise data. And I think having a real time on-site instrument is the way to help with some of this stuff. Once again, FTIR is not perfect, but at least we know kind of right then and there that we're doing things the right way and we can get you a number on site. And you might ask, you know, Blake, why do we care 
about things that are below detection limits, right? Like detection limits are already insanely low. Um, you know, a PPM is, is such a small number. Why do we care about PPV? And I think it's just kind of like the changing of times. You know, we see this with technology. You know, if you, you got a phone, you can look up just about anything. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was just kind of the start of that process, right? So even in stack testing, uh, you know, we might be a little slow to respond, but we have to understand, you know, it's that adapt or die mentality. This instrumentation that exists out there is very real. It works very, very well. Um, and, you know, it's really, it's kind of paving a new path for stack testing and a whole slew of testing for the matter. Um, some of these instruments are starting to look at hydrogen purity, uh, CO2 purity for like beverages, uh, just absolutely amazing things that at the end of the day, they impact you and I, because there's a lot of health concern about this stuff. Um, we're learning every day, you know, we're finding more about PFAS and formaldehyde, you name it. Um, these are targets for, you know, via the EPA for a very real reason. And at the end of the day too, they, they're expensive. So um, your health is so important to you and us understanding this sort of stuff. That's why I think it's so important to see the PPV stuff because OSHA might have a PPM limit, but who's to say that might not go a little lower in the future. So as always, technology, it's not always something we need to be afraid of, um, but if we embrace it and we do it the right way, good things are going to happen. So in our space, what tech is sort of being used? Well, there's uh, quite a few instruments out there in the FTIR world. Uh, everything from MKS is a very robust, it's very standard and standard stack testing. Uh, you have CAI, you have Spectrum, you have Max Analytical, um, you have all sorts of instruments that are out there, but really what, what do you need on site? Um, you know, what we have found, and not to, to play favorites by any means, it's just what we, we know, it's what we've used. We have hundreds of field tests with these, these things, and we're, we're not afraid to try something new and put it through the test. But like I said before, a manufacturer will sell you the moon. They will tell you that it can do it, but then you take it on and test or your process. Uh, you know, we do installs with these things, and then it's like, okay, we're, we're seeing a lot of issues, so what's going on? So uh, the Max IR with a, it's called a, a Tom, which is basically an oxidizer module that goes with the Tom, a uh, very powerful combination. And we can see things in, you know, sub PPB, single digit PPB. Um, and even in some circumstances, they're talking parts per trillion. So uh, it's a number that I can't even get my head around, but it, it's coming and it, it exists. Uh, and a lot of what we have done uh, with the quad Y, the low level formaldehyde stuff revolves around the star boost. So once again, hundreds of tests with this thing, uh, really impressed with the technology that Max put out there. Uh, and they have some modifications coming in which you can use a long pass filter and can see a whole slew of things. So BTEX, uh, you know, if you're looking at that from a, a cement manufacturer sort of thing, or Acrolin, if you're on the ethanol side of the world, um, this instrument is pretty amazing. And there are other manufacturers that do a nice job too, but uh, this is just what we found to work really, really well within our company. A little brief data overview here. Uh, this is kind of just showing the power of the instrument uh, and taking about a one hour sample run here. You see that that number for the average is 0 0.017, well, that's PPM. So that's quite literally 17 ppb on a for, you know turbine for formaldehyde, and that is a wet number, so it bumps up a little bit. And there's an O2 correction of 15, percent um, but at the end of the day, you know, well below that 91 ppb limit that was proposed by the EPA. Um, AP42, I believe, is the emission factor uh, is sky high compared to what actually is coming out of these turbines at high load. Um, so this technology that exists helps prove this. And we were seeing the standard deviation of three PPB. So just absolutely crazy stuff. And once again, we've done this on all sorts of things. You know, for example, this is, you know, the duck burners, uh, you know, this is over the period of five different field studies. And in each of the bars are three one-hour runs. So you can see when duck burners are on, it's a 
the part of the turbine world for those of you that might not know but essentially they're they just add some extra fuel consumption heat uh, and so obviously when you're you're burning a little bit more fuel you're getting a little bit more from formaldehyde right so uh, we found that formaldehyde stems from the oxidation of methane and that's where the stuff's coming from largely it doesn't correlate with CO on all circumstances. Um, but what you do see is that when the duck burners are on, it's definitely higher than when the duck burners are off. And some of these are peaker, some of them are full load, you know, mid load, you name it. But it's pretty conclusive that duck burners off have less formaldehyde emissions. Actually, going back looking at it now, I do apologize. The y axis there should be PPM. So, sorry for the confusion. Uh, another study set on the on a boiler set. You know, we look at this um, same sort of thing. Boilers tend to run really well on natural gas. You're looking at around 30 ppb formaldehyde. Um, we can do this with HCL. We can do this with a whole slew of things. Um, but we just have a tremendous amount of work done. Uh, when these technologies were implemented, they came out in about 2019. Uh, we kind of jumped on them as fast as we could and we put them through the ringer. So you'll see a lot of formaldehyde data, but that's not to say that we can't use this towards a whole slew of things because uh, we can. Uh, but this is just showing more or less how consistent natural gas is. And then if we use a fuel blend, uh, you see kind of the inconsistencies there, depending on what they're burning. And in this case, we weren't quite sure what they were burning, but obviously a little nastier than natural gas. Now, there's another instrument that works. It's called the MAX GC FTIR. Um, not too popular of use, but it does have some you know, implica implications and uses. Uh, the way this thing works, once again, I'm not going to go over it full details, but we collect samples on what are called TDTs or thermal desorption tubes, and they're run through a sampler as two mass flow controllers. And we basically sample a really, really low volume, you know, about 50 mils a minute on each tube. Um, and we follow method 18. Uh, we take the tubes and we throw it in the desorber here. And then that off gases into the GC and based off the molecular weight and time. For those of you who are familiar with GC, same sort of principle comes into the, the IR gas cell, and then we do the analysis through there. So a little bit different of a technology, you know, the FTIR is real time. We have a pump flowing through it consistently. This works a little different. It's kind of like data capture. Um, and then it gives us a nice little sample like this where we can do the fun little illusion there. And that's how we do the analysis. So we made it to the end of the presentation. It should be noted that the, the MAX GCFTIR can be used for a wide range of applications too, but um, more or less, we like the real-time stuff a lot. So that MAX IR, the MKS, uh, there's other companies like Spectrum, you name it, they do some nice stuff with FTIR. So the overall end game of the FTIR, you know, what I'm kind of here to do in the pitch to you is I want you to be comfortable with your data and your data quality programs. You know, can you confidently say that you stand by your data? You know, can you potentially have to go and sit in court and get grilled about, you know, data quality? Was this done the right way? Can you confidently say that, yes, you know, we're, we're good with it. It's okay. Uh, it does happen. I've been through that process where, you know, you have lawyers that are questioning the data set and, um, Luckily, due to our validation program and our consistency with the training programs, no issues. Uh, we do things the right way and we stand by our data. So I want you to feel that way too. Um, understand that the FTIR is a great tool for compliance and engineering. Uh, wide range of applicability. Like I said, it's not just stack testing, but if you need to install a SEMS or if you need to look at some process gases or anything along those lines, uh, this thing can be used for a whole wide range of suite of things in all sorts of industries. So very powerful stuff. And uh, it's not all sunshines and rainbows with the FTIR. It's not perfect. Uh, when it's used in the wrong pair of hands, it quite frankly is a scary instrument. And, um, you know, going back to my travels within this industry, I've, I've done this uh, internationally and I've done it in most of the United States and I've seen a lot over my short time of doing this 
Um, so just the, the lack of qualified individuals that run these things, it is fairly um, concerning. It's interesting because we the barriers of entry in the stack testing are relatively low. So small firms are, are more than capable to go out there and do this. Uh, they could send you a low dollar bid. They're tough for big firms to compete with, but the big firms are paying a lot of money for accreditation, for training and in, in doing things as best as they can. Um, you know, the, all the conferences, you name it, um, it, it's expensive. So there are certain things that we just, we can't compete with and that's okay, but do understand that there are a lot of small firms out there that give this thing a bad name. Uh, and I would like to see that change with some time. Validation, uh, you know, if there was a quiz question, it'd be, you know, what do you, what do you need to do? Uh, if there's any takeaway today, uh, it's a couple of things, which I'm, I'm guessing there will be some questions on this, but validate your data. data. If your customer asks for validated data, um, it might not mean anything to you, but at least it kind of puts that, um, I don't want to call it fear, but the idea on the table for your source testing firm that you know what you're asking for. Um, and it should give them, if they're scrambling with it, you kind of know what you're dealing with. So get that validation done. And if you're not doing it, do it. Don't just check that data quality box. Um, like I said, compliance is doing the bare minimum, right? And not to push more work on you, but do know that it's uh, there's a lot more applicability out there than just doing your annual compliance test. So if you have an issue or if you make a major change, get your testing done, uh, bring out a qualified firm and make sure you're doing things the right way. It's just going to save you a lot of time and money. And everyone likes that. You know, we try to save some money. Um, but just for me personally, it, it saves a lot of headaches. You know, if you're an EHS manager, you have so much to deal with as is. You know, you're, you're not just dealing with air. You're dealing with water, soil sampling, you know, safety programs. I, the, you name it. Um, your your day-to-day -day is pretty full already. So I, rather than just check the box and worry about it, or, you know, when it comes up again in another year, you're scrambling, just be proactive. And when you get into a groove there, you know, you get with a firm that you enjoy. Usually it's a, a match made in heaven for, for an EHS person because they just get it done and they go about their day. So uh, really what I want to do as a whole is just bolster the FTIR's reputation. I, I'm a firm believer in this technology. It's got a long ways to go. Um, but it's come a long ways as well. So do know that if you dislike the FTIR, don't just completely discredit it. Uh, give those who are well-trained in it a chance and do know that there are dedicated teams within firms that purely work on FTIRs. And this is their bread and butter. Um, so by no means should you be afraid of this tool. It's a very powerful and useful thing. So with that, that's all I have for today. And once again, I thank you for sitting in yet another virtual meeting, um, but I look forward to any questions that any of you may have. And please feel free to email me uh, or call uh, anytime and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. So with that, we'll, I'm sure Jessica will chime in here. And we'll get into some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Blake, for a fantastic presentation. We do have some time for q and I guarantee you we are not going to get a chance to answer everybody's question um, who did submit one today. So bear with us as we get through as many as we can. So I know a very technical presentation, but can you expand some on improper spam factors? Does this mean if you are measuring 10 ppm, your spam factor should not be 1000 ppm? What spam factor would you use measuring 10 ppm? Perfect. Yeah. So going back to a span factor, right? A span factor is just a multiplier. And quite simply, that's it. So in the FTIR world, your span factor should be 1.0. And if you go to like 1.05, 1.1, that's a five to 10% span factor. So it doesn't directly impact when you're studying a span factor based off of PPM, it's just literally a multiplier. So when I mentioned it before, let's just pretend you had a 100 PPM bottle and you were reading 80 or so. So you know that you're 20% low. Well, you shouldn't span it down to match it because it's very likely that you have some other deeper issues going on. Um, and so it's our recommendation that your span factor should not be touched. 
Um, but if you must, they should be, you know, no greater or less than 5%. Okay, which makes sense. So I, I appreciate you answering that question. Is there an upper limit of, sam of sampling system temps? Is it, or is it just the hotter, the better? Uh, you would think hotter, the better. And there's some applications where, you know, uh, you know, based off of emissions, you know, there's like natural gas turbines, right, that are several hundred degrees C and uh, they get they get wicked hot. Um, but in terms of FTIR testing, we are kind of capped where you basically what I've mentioned, too, is you want to match your sampling temperature with your recipes and your calibration data. So let's just pretend you're running a 375 degree Fahrenheit, you know, analysis, you should be sampling at the same temperature, just a general rule of thumb. Absolute upper limit is usually right around 400 degrees if you have to go up that high. And that's just because we get to that melting point of Teflon. Um, and of course, you don't want to melt your sampling systems because that's pretty expensive. I, I can only imagine. Um, does that happen frequently where, you know, people, people the temperature does get that high? Uh, it happens more than I care to admit. You know, we see it from time to time with like SEMS installations and stuff and things just happen, you know, kind of like we said to uh, equipment breaks and stack testing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you got temperature controllers that go kind of wacky, but uh, yeah, really, as long as you set it up the way it's meant to be set up, testing is going to go very smoothly, but it can happen. And as we say in stack testing, uh, if it can, it will happen. So it's it's not impossible. Heard that term before. So yeah, definitely. So can you take us through what a typical validation process will look like? Typical validation process is based off of the firm. Uh, we strongly suggest that, you know, as you're collecting data, your field teams, your chemists, your FTIR spectroscopists, whatever you want to call them, your operator, they're consistently checking their recipes and their data as they're going along to make sure that it's accurate and precise. Once you get your data at the end of the day, we recommend that your QAQC and the reporting people that are gonna be looking at it after the fact, look at a couple of data points within each test run. Um, and so if you're doing three one hour tests, right, you're probably gonna to wanna to look anywhere from three to six data points to val you know, validate your data. Okay. And for a company who is not used to going through this validation process, if they're just starting out, what advice do you have for them? Uh, number one rule of advice <laughs> is if you aren't doing it, you need to do it. It is in the methods. Um, I've had the luxury of being subcontracted by a lot of firms in this industry. Uh, and it is quite scary for even large firms that don't do this, but it's in method 320. It's in ASTM 6348. It is a must have. So you need to start doing it if you aren't doing it today. Excellent advice. Now, there are a bunch of uh, FTIR brands in the market that can provide low detection limits needed for the new formaldehyde rule. I've heard about three during this webinar, but one is not sold anymore. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so what we see, you know, a manufacturer will sell you the moon, right? Like their instrument's always going to be the best. Um, and we generally, with what we do, we like to put that to the test. So not only do we study these things on a bench, uh, we, we actually take them out in the field and we have hundreds of field projects to date since these technologies have been administered. Uh, it's our recommendation that there's really, there's two good brands out there right now for this quad Y stuff. Um, one is from a company called Max Analytical. They're out of Windsor, Connecticut. Um, and another group is called Spectrum, and they're down in Texas. So they both provide a little bit different of a setup on their instruments, but they both provide abilities to get low detection. Um, us at Montrose, we use the Max IR, and we found a lot of really good success with using that instrument in this field. Which is great to know. Has have you guys at Montrose experienced in working with the, the vendors? Have you experienced the supply issues? Has the supply chain affected any of your ability to get the instruments that you guys have needed? Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I, I think everyone's sick of hearing it and it's uh, it's everywhere. Right. And even for us as a stack testing company, an environmental company, um, you know, if we need to buy an instrument on the fly, forget about it. You know, we're looking at 12 to 16 week lead times and that's what we've got right now. 
Okay. So companies, if you are not doing this, you need to give yourself some, some extra time uh, to get the, the necessary instruments. Well, I know we don't have too much uh, time left for questions, but uh, Blake, I'd really like it if you could just wrap up with, you know, three or four main takeaways for today's attendees. Yeah, key takeaways, right? Validate your data. If you don't do it, it's an absolute must. Um, don't be afraid of the FTIR. You know, it's not a black box or a voodoo box or anything like that. It's a powerful instrument. Uh, when it's used in the right hands, it can be used for engineering and for compliance and even processes like SEMS and all sorts of process optimization. Hopefully you don't mind my dog's tail wagging in the back there. So forget um, <laughs> working from home. And, uh, you know, last but not least, don't be afraid to ask and reach out. You know, even if you have these things already installed, there are experts and there are really good firms out there that are willing to help you. Uh, we take a lot of pride and this is kind of our specialty. And my main goal with the FTIR is just to promote it and to give it a better name than it already has because mm -hmm. it doesn't have a great name everywhere. <laughs> so we have a ways to go. So that's it. That's good. And, you know, I, I did a, a webinar about investing in sustainability, actually, um, last week. And one of the big things that we talked about was, you know, transparency and truth and, and sharing data and, you know, really all working together, um, you know, to mitigate environmental risks and stuff. So, you know, good way to end today's event. Well, you know, Blake, I appreciate your time today. Glad your dogs could join us a little bit. Oh, there you There's go. one right now in the background. Again, perks of working for home, from home. Uh, I want to thank the team at Montrose for another fantastic event. Thank you to the attendees who joined us live. And thank you again to those who are going to watch this on demand. At this point, I'm going to conclude today's webinar. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.